Welcome everyone to today's town hall event, HIV is not a crime. I'm Sunny Hostin and I will be your moderator for today and I am thrilled to be here. I want to encourage the audience to submit your questions in the comments section below and we will try to address as many as possible at the end of the broadcast. Also, please let us know where you are visiting from. This is an issue that affects more than 30 states across the country, so the chances are good that you can do something to help reform HIV laws in your own state. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge and thank the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation for making today's event possible and for leading the campaign, the charge, to modernize discriminatory HIV laws. Elizabeth Taylor worked tirelessly throughout the 1980s when the AIDS crisis was fueled by fear, not facts. In 1991, she founded the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation to fulfill her desire to see an AIDS-free world. Elizabeth spent her life fighting for marginalized communities around the globe. And now her foundation is continuing that legacy by tackling the latest barrier in the AIDS fight, outdated laws that discriminate against people living with HIV. Like Elizabeth, our panelists today have dedicated their lives to social justice. They represent some of the nation's top experts on HIV decriminalization, and I am so very honored to welcome them all today to this discussion. Robert Suttle, who was incarcerated as a result of his HIV status and has since become an advocate for reform. Douglas Brooks, who is here representing Gilead Sciences, Sciences as their executive director of community education. Cecilia Chung from the Transgender Law Center where she directs the center's strategic initiative. And Rick Chavez Zabur, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is the executive director of Equality California. Now, we all know this is a complex issue that is just not frequently talked about in mainstream criminal justice reform, and that is a shame, but it's a conversation that needs to happen. The laws are outdated, and the repercussions are disproportionate, disproportionate for those affected. As we learn in the next hour, this is also an issue that has very real consequences to public health. Fear of persecution prevents people still from getting tested and treated. Given the recent pandemic and the current movement for racial justice, there is no better time to be talking about how we can do better, do better to protect our communities. So let's begin. Robert Suttle is our first guest, and he is no stranger to this issue because he lived it. He is a recognized HIV social justice leader, social justice educator, and advisor on the HIV Justice Network's Global Advisory Panel. Welcome, Robert Suttle. Thank you so much for being here. Now, Robert, you just exemplify, you, exemplify uh, why we are here today. And uh, let, me, let me ask you um, this. Uh, you were sent to prison because of your HIV status. And honestly, I, I just can't believe that. Can you please take a few minutes to share your story? Yeah, absolutely. I was diagnosed with HIV uh, back in 2003. Um, didn't know much about living with HIV. Um, one thing, those who are living with HIV would understand that when you're given that diagnosis, you're not automatically given the skills to negotiate how to disclose your HIV status. And so you, I was told that I could go on and live a healthy life, and that is what I did. I, was, I had two months before I was graduating from college, like I found out in October, then I graduated in December. And so my life was about to change uh, as I was you know, becoming a young adult and moving out into the professional world. Um, but I had to you know, address the fact that I was living with HIV. And so it was uh, a really life-changing, um, experience for me, um, one that many people, again, living with HIV would feel, understand the, the emotions and the feelings that you go through around it. But I had plans. I had plans for my life. I was gradu I graduated from college. So, you know, I was feeling pretty optimistic um, despite learning this news. 
Um, and so fast forward five years to address, you know, why, how I ended up going to prison. Um, again, negotiating how to disclose your status to, to someone, to anybody, is, is never an easy thing. And the only way to really learn it is through trial and error, really, um, disclosing it to family or friends or whoever you can, uh, whenever you can. Um, it's not safe for people to disclose their status, and so it, it's really up to that individual to determine uh, when they feel comfortable sharing their status, regardless of how society thinks that we should be disclosing at any and all times, but it's not legally safe to do that. And so I met someone that I was casually in a relationship with, um, a sexual relationship, um, someone that I didn't know very well, but, you know, as a black gay man living in the South, you know, us connecting with each other, a sense of community, a sense of belonging, and wanting to establish a relationship, you take a chance to see if it's going to work with someone. But unfortunately, th that relationship was pretty contentious in that we didn't always see eye to eye just in general. You know, it's, it wasn't uh, contentious around my status, at least not at the beginning, but just we didn't see eye to eye. And so as a result of that relationship ending, um, my HIV status came back into play by a mutual friend that I had disclosed my status to prior. As a result, I was arrested. Uh, he had pressed charges against me. I was arrested at work on my job. I was arrested in front of my coworkers. <laughs> and as a result, I had to go to many hearings and eventually I was convicted uh, in 2009 and um, I had to do six months in prison. Well, it's, it's one thing. Um to experience the burden of these unjust laws. It's another thing to become a lifelong advocate, right? And an activist uh, and, and just putting yourself out there like that. Is there a particular moment when you knew, I've got to fight, I've got to, I got to fight um, for justice? Because I think there are people out there that um, want to help and they want the inspiration to do so. What was your moment? You know, my moment for me, because I had six months to sit in prison and think about what I was experiencing, I had never heard of HIV criminalization laws um, in my life. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot to adjust when you're living with HIV and just adjusting to life, and then to be unaware of laws and how you um, can become criminally liable um, is very unclear. You know, um, it's the worst thing that anybody living with mm -hmm. HIV would want to experience. And so for me, um, I felt like my life was over. Um, and so I had, to really think, I had to really think hard about my future because um, being black, being gay, being HIV positive in, and living in the South, you know, it's, you know, being a black man in America, um, there just seems to be no hope as to how to move forward or, or get beyond these barriers or these struggles. And so um, I remember, uh, being in prison and talking to uh, the psychologist there, and he reminded me it's just like a wall, you know, a, a brick wall with the cylinders. And he's like, your life, this experience is just one of those cylinders in the wall. It's not the whole wall. And so that really mm -hmm. helped me see some things a little differently. And so as soon as I got out of prison, I don't know, I mean, I immediately went online and started reading about, uh, at least, I don't know, acclimating myself back to society. Um, because a lot can change in terms of your habits and, uh, after 180 days in prison. And um, I just ran across a blog that was speaking about um, the very thing that I had gone through, and I didn't know what it was called, but as I'm reading, I'm like, wow, this is what I experienced. I really felt this was an injustice um, to to, for many people, being black, being gay, because the way that you're portrayed as if like you're really attempting to, to bring harm to someone um, is, is quite misleading. You know, this message about public safety is quite misleading as mm -hmm. it relates to HIV, a person's HIV status. And I felt like it was important for me to use my voice to set, sort of set the record straight, to bring awareness that the people that are impacted, people that are being sent to prison are not folks that should be there. They're not people that should be criminally, held criminally liable um, when they've not created any harm. And it, this is simply based on 
um, a person's HIV status and, and nothing else, you know, about them. And so, uh, again, I felt like, what did I have to lose? I had lost my job, I lost my benefits, mm -hmm. I lost everything that I was right at the cusp of starting a new career. I was 29 years old, a time when a young person is looking to mm. blossom, to get out there in the world and make something of themselves. And here I was facing, um, facing prison, facing a, a criminal uh, a felony conviction. You know, what, what is striking to me is we're in the middle of a global health pandemic, and I think people need to think about what if you were uh, COVID positive, right? You tested COVID positive, and you were in a relationship with someone, and you, you gave them COVID, and you were put in jail for it. It's so similar. I, I just, I, it's, when you think about it in, in those terms, it, it would be criminal to, to imprison someone for uh, infecting someone else with COVID. But what's also striking about this issue is its intersectionality, right? It's, uh, you're, you're talking about, I, I think, uh, an issue of public health, of stigma, uh, marginalized communities and and one of criminal justice reform and you've become a major advocate for criminal justice reform and um, kudos to you for doing that I salute you for that how do you think um, changing s these specific laws support the larger fight to improve our criminal justice system because I really believe th this type of law would be applied to uh, other um, public health issues well, I definitely think the HIV movement sets, uh, I mean, sets the the path, you know, to how how to do this. Um, with COVID, we don't know what it's what it's sort of what it's going to happen in towards. I mean, the next few years as regards to it being considered criminal or in the criminal code, if you will. Um, however, people can be arrested for it and charged under, you know, other general criminal uh, char statutes or charges. Um, so we don't know how, how it's going to go. But um, I'm personally not interested in reforming criminal justice system because the system is what it is. But what I am more interested in is, is supporting communities of people who are impacted because we are the ones that are really out there suffering. We are the ones really out there experiencing the, the things that are happening firsthand by our criminal justice system. It is not a just system. It is a system founded on racism. It's a, a system founded on bigotry. And this is through years, years since policing started in America. And it has since evolved, you know, from since they couldn't get us in slavery, they couldn't hold us down with the Jim Crow laws, so they decided to create these felony laws that impact uh, communities that are marginalized. It affects all their freedoms, their freedoms to exist as black people, uh, people of color, uh, in, and it exists, it affects their ability to, to live a life free of expression. You know, whether they choose to be gay, whether they choose to have sex, if they are, if they are living with the disease, and it's, it's, I'm at a point now where I really see this for what it is, and it's really not based on fear, and that these communities of people are bringing harm to our society or to our world. This is really based on race. It is really based mm -hmm. on um, enforcing discriminatory laws based on race and people's uh, sex or sexual orientation. That is pretty much what it is. So I'm more interested in supporting those communities, helping finding ways to build them up so that they can be sustainable into the fight uh, to change laws and to make things better for our society. Because the criminal justice system is not changing. Only way that it's changed is to it's become more sophisticated in the way that it's continuing to oppress communities. And I think with the times that we're living in right now, I think people are finally coming to understand uh, just how bad the system is against these marginalized communities. So I would want to see more effort to support well, I, the work, the leaders that are part of these communities so that they can continue the fight. Well, you being part of the work, Robert, I think is certainly going to make a difference because you are right, this affects certainly black and brown communities disproportionately, and we know that. And we are experiencing another pandemic, as we mentioned before. And you've seen, right, the correlations drawn already between the stigma around HIV and COVID. How do you think history will judge this moment two years from now? 
in relation to both of these viruses? How will it shape our political future in America? Because I really think we are experiencing a movement, not just a moment. Well, I hope, I hope that society will be able to understand or make this, you know, understand the correlation that we're trying to to make here with it, HIV and COVID. It is my worst fear that COVID will become part of the criminal code, you know, specifically to COVID, uh, just like HIV uh, had become, you know, years ago. And, and yet this type of laws never was addressed. You know, there was incentives given to states to address their, their relationship uh, with HIV transmission. And so they were giving incentives, they were giving monies to do that. And so when that provision ended, you know, it was up to the states to figure out, okay, what we're gonna to do to address HIV. And so they decided to make criminal codes. And no, no one in any legislature over the years had decided to go back and review these laws. You know, and so I think for us in the movement, we have an ability now to uh, intervene to say, no, you're not gonna do this. You did this with HIV. We're not gonna allow you to do this with COVID. And so I appreciate the Elizabeth Taylor Foundation and I appreciate uh, those organizations within, within my community, my HIV community, uh, addressing this together with HIV and COVID uh, so that we can let the world know that we are not gonna let our governments do this again. I um, applaud you for your work. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your voice. Um, always and today and continue continue the work thank you so much robert for joining us we really appreciate it thank you so much our you. next speaker is thank the you so thank you our next speaker is the executive director of community engagement at gilead sciences inc which is the pharmaceutical company behind prep and several other medical advances in hiv care he formerly served as the head of the white house's office of national aids policy under president barack obama and has been a longtime advocate for hiv research and reform welcome thank you so much for joining us doug brooks now, Doug, you've just heard Robert Suttle's incredible story and advocacy, and we know these kinds of accounts, unfortunately, are not new to you. Can you help us understand where the science is today and why this makes Robert's experience really just so much more egregious? Sure. Um, so first, uh, Robert is such a, uh, an example of such a courageous human being uh, to share his personal experience of an attempt to dehumanize him, um, which clearly didn't work uh, because he is such a lovely human being. And, mm -hmm. you know, th these laws are um, codify discrimination against a certain group of people uh, with a certain disease. And as you said, so perfectly, it's not about all communicable diseases, it's about this particular one. And Robert said um, and gave us the reasons why, you know, homophobia, racism, uh, and all the stigma. Mm -hmm. And yes, the science is really clear. Uh, the CDC, our nation's public health entity, has said that when a person who is HIV positive uh, is on treatment and virally suppressed, HIV sexual transmission is just not going to happen, is preventable. And uh, in, in, in our world, we call it undetectable equals untransmittable, U equals U. And this, the science is not, uh, is not weak by any means. I've said the CDC has cited it, but also uh, it has been cited by the National Institutes of Health, NIH. And while um, Dr. Fauci has become the most famous doctor in maybe in the world uh, to the public, he has been our doctor for a very long time and someone who we love deeply and he loves us. And Dr. Fauci actually wrote a piece um, along with uh, uh, Dr. Diffenbach and Eisenberg in um, JAMA, in the Journal of American Medical uh, Association, uh, on this U equals U piece, and it's based on very um, 
uh, HPTN052, which was a huge, huge study. I shouldn't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it was thousands of people, uh, heterosexual couples, one of whom was HIV positive and one who was not. And it showed definitively that when a person is on treatment, and a virally suppressed transmission does not occur. And then that was also further demonstrated in the partner study and the opposites attract study, which were uh, based on male to male sexual encounters and was further proved. So, you know, the science is really clear. And, and I think that's part of our work is putting that out into the world and helping people understand uh, the science of it all. Well, as a, a leading advocate and someone who served under President Obama in the fight against HIV and AIDS, can you tell us how the current pandemic, COVID-19, relates to the fight against HIV? Because honestly, I see so many parallels uh, between the two, especially the disproportionate effect it's had on black and brown, uh, brown communities. It just, it's, it's incredible to me because it, it just, um, you, you see this, uh, the systemic racism that is just exposed during both pandemics. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's, as you said earlier, this this um, uh, forum that we're using, this virtual forum, is a little difficult. And now, even I'm going to, but uh, there, early on, there was uh, some conversation in the HIV community about making comparisons, and there are people who have felt very strongly that we shouldn't be comparing them. And just to try to get it clear in my head, I actually wrote a piece for myself and said some have argued that to compare COVID-19 to HIV and to the onslaught of HIV uh, is near sacrilegious, that um, the government and societal responses are incomparable. And I don't try to refute those facts. They are facts. But there are similarities. The initial denial, the fear of each other, the fear of connection, the horrific isolating deaths the resignation to getting it, the trauma that's been um, visited upon people, the desire to get back to normal, and as you two were discussing earlier, the late understanding and acknowledgement of the impact on black lives and the subsequent unequal uh, care and resources. I mean, it, it, I, I, I think um, there are some parts of it that um, we can't compare, and, and, and I honor and respect those. Um, but the sim similarities are um, also pretty myriad. Yeah. Well, Gilead is playing an important role in this new fight to reform and modernize HIV laws, and it's such an important fight. Why is this effort important to you personally, and why is it an issue that Gilead is putting its weight behind? So we are we're very fortunate uh, at our company to have the opportunity to use our resources to uh, fill gaps to meet unmet need. And we're able to do things that maybe the government doesn't, won't do, or other foundations or, or organizations won't or can't do. And uh, in this case, it's the right thing. And it's an opportunity for us to move toward a, a more just society. Uh, for me personally, you know, I'm a black gay man living with HIV. I know what hatred and discrimination feel like. And to have an opportunity to work with the women and men who are on this panel, the women and men who are watching this and who are doing the work every day in such a much more uh, important way than I am. Uh, but if I get to stand beside them and use the platform that I have the fortune of being uh, on to help advance this work, it's, um, it's an honor. Uh and I thank you for your work. I thank you for your work. Um, you've been uh, just an advocate for so long, and um, we appreciate you. So thank you, Doug. And thank you for joining us, even virtually with all its problems. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Evaluations at Transgender Law Center a health commissioner of San Francisco, and an internationally recognized civil rights leader who advocates for, advocates for HIV, AIDS awareness and care, LGBTQ equality, and social justice. Welcome, Cecilia Chung. 
Now, as a transgender woman well, living with thank HIV, you for me. these are laws. Oh. Oh, thank you for, for, for joining us. Now, as a transgender woman living with HIV, these are laws that specifically target you and your community. Can you share more about how and why that is? That's a really great question, Sunny. I, you mentioned earlier about um, intersectionality, and I think that this is where it plays a huge part because, like transgender um, people, especially um, transgender women, um, black and brown transgender women, um, they are in the intersection of race and gender. And um, in addition to that, um, there are a lot of other discriminations and stigma that they have to confront. Um, and so, with all those with all those like kind of challenges, um, it's really easy to see um, why um, transgender people of color oftentimes have to resort to like some other like survival um, economy, such as you know sex work or um, other um, uh, less popular like um, street economy um, to survive. Um, and when they become HIV positive. Um, not only did that, you know, further discriminate against them, it also like take away the freedom to make better decisions because um, when you have to disclose, you know, that you're HIV positive, you know, like you have to um, really be prepared to deal with, you know, the rejection, you know, being transgender is, you know, like mm -hmm. it's hard enough, you know, and so it almost feels like we have to like, go through like different challenges and hurdles just to be who we are. Um, in addition to that, um, when we look at the whole criminal justice system, like um, what Robert had mentioned earlier, um, that it is not a equal system for everyone, you know, like so um, black and brown folks and um, folks who are transgender um, usually, you know, like um, are disproportionately impacted by that. And, you know, like we all know that, you know, when you are incarcerated, it's less likely that you are going to get really good health care. Um, case in point, you know, there is a transgender woman um, named Roxana Hernandez who was in the ICE detention um, who um, died because of like um, the lack of health care and attention. Um, and so for us, um, revising these HIV criminalization law is not only a right thing to do, but it's also a harm reduction approach to make sure that, you know, like we don't just like lock people in cages, but give them the resources they need so they can survive and thrive. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned black and brown um, communities. Are there other communities that you feel are disproportionately affected by these laws? Yes. Um, so when I talk about black and brown community, um, we are talking about that intersection, no community, um, for instance, you know, like the migrant community, mm -hmm. you know, those who like escape violence from their mm -hmm. country to come to this country to like find a better life, to look for a better life. But instead, you know, like they were being criminalized, you know, because um, they didn't have the paperwork to stay here or they don't have the paperwork um, to really access, you know, the healthcare necessary, you know, to help them thrive. Um, and so you would call it double whammy. And I think that, you know, like I, I call that, you know, like um, a different, um, yeah, different hurdles. Um, and, um, and in addition mm -hmm. to that, you know, like when we look at the other communities that we talk about, um, black and brown trans women, um, trans women who are immigrants um, and, you know, those who have to, like, resort to sex work to survive. Um, it's not a very safe environment when there are no other choices for them. And so, um, you know, this is a really vicious right. circle. Um, and when you look at when they don't have access to good um, educations, um, and actually from one of our studies, Positively Trans, um, that um, interviewed over 150 um, trans people of color living with HIV, 80% of them got kicked out by their family before age 18. So this is the kind of like oh. path that they have to get on. And instead of like trying to help them and help them build something meaningful, like we decide to send them to cages um, to continue to like persecute them. 
Hmm. Wow. Well, your organization is part of the Health Not Prisons uh, Collective. Can you share more about that collective and its role in this campaign? Okay, the um, Health Not Prisons Collective is made up of a coalitions of like community-based organizations. Um, most of um, the um, the leadership in, in these uh, organizations are all like community organizers. So we build the grassroots mo uh, movement and also mobilize the community necessary, you know, like to show up and to demand change. Um, and you know, bottom line is, you know, like the more that we can actually engage in these conversations, the more that we can tell our stories, the more that people will start recognizing how irrational it is, you know, to create these kind of laws that criminalize somebody just because they have a health condition. Now, um, can you describe the correlation between stigma and HIV laws and what that does to the trans community and, and really the broader one as well? Yeah, um, yes, yeah. so stigma is, um, you know, it's really that irrational fear, you know, like, um, and sometimes, you know, it turns into homophobia, sometimes it turns into transphobia, and sometimes it turns into, like, um, the kind of anti-black and anti-brown racism we see currently, you know, like, it also, you know, like, it's trying to point the finger at those who um, have who are living with HIV instead of looking at this as a shared responsibility. Um, you know, like with other STDs, mm -hmm. people know how to protect themselves. You know, they learn to protect themselves. With COVID-19, you know, like um, we learn to like put a face mask on when we go out and sometimes we use hand sanitizer. This is not just a one person responsibility. This is, you know, everybody's responsibility. And if we want to really create, you know, like a healthier society, we want to make sure that, you know, people really um, take um, accountability, you know, for their own health. You know, there are the science now to help prevent HIV, and there are the science now, you know, to live a a fuller life and there are the science now to help people become like untransmittable even with if, when they are living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So with all these advances, how come we're still stuck with these archaic laws? Mm. It's, it's, it's un unreal to me, honestly. Um, well, given your experience with, with these laws, what is the pathway to change? How do you envision it? Um, there, there are several things that I think, you know, like everyone can like start um, thinking about. One is, you know, everyone should get an HIV test. Uh, two, if you are sexually active, consider, you know, getting on um, the PrEP, which is like the pre-exposure prophylaxis, you know, like it would like help to prevent, you know, like um, someone to um, to get HIV. Um, and then if somebody is HIV positive, we need to encourage them to seek care and be in treatment because with the proper care and treatment, they can have a long, full life. And, you know, and some of us who've been living with HIV for almost 30 years um, are testament to that. Um, and bottom line is, you know, like we can't just keep sending people in cages. We want to make sure that, you know, we put the resources where it's necessary, create more housing, you know, have better health care and have better education and um, so that, you know, people can have a chance, you know, to live a full life. Now, I'm sure there are people watching this right now that will watch it um, in the future. What can audience members do to support change, to support these changes? Um, so there are states um, who are currently engaging in effort um, to reform um, or modernize HIV criminalization laws. Um, and so, like, look for those organizations and effort, you know, be part of it, or call your um, Congress representative and state representative to make sure that, you know, they really, like, focus on creating laws based on evidence and science and not fear. Um, and, you know, and really hoping that, you know, like, we can continue to build on that and influence, you know, those who we voted for to help us, you know, change um, the world into a better place. 
Cecilia, thank you so much for your work, your advocacy, and of course, for joining us tonight, or today. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, now, we have a final guest. Our final guest is no stranger in the fight to reform HIV laws. He heads up Equality California and is a distinguished lawyer with a very long history of advocacy for LGBTQ civil rights. Welcome, Rick Zeber. And, and Rick, I have to ask you, am I pronouncing that correctly? Because it's been driving me crazy as I've been reading. No, it was absolutely perfect, so thank you. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Well, Rick, I was saying that this is um, such a complex issue, and thank you so much for um, joining us. We heard earlier uh, on the panel Robert's story, Robert Suttle, who you know spent six months in jail really just for being uh, HIV positive. And uh, I hear that you have another example of one of these laws, and I really do think that it will help our audience to better understand this issue if we can tie it to a specific case. Well, we, um, you know, there's there are a lot of cases sort of out there, and um, essentially, uh, uh, you know, some of what happens is you actually have folks that are arrested under these laws uh, for circumstances that have no public health threat, uh, where they're not a risk to the for the public, um, and you know, a, a key a key example that happens many times is that you actually have. Um, transgender women, often transgender women of color, um, who are, you know, uh, the old term walking while trans, and um, they may end up um, getting uh, arrested for um, sex work, you know, often when the, that's not what they're doing. Um, and then because in many cases, uh, these HIV crimes extend to, um, uh, you know, increase uh, the, what might be a minor, um, infraction, even for you know solicitation or sex work, it basically will turn that charge into a felony. Um, and so often you'll have uh, many of these women who are you know charged with a crime, uh, basically because they were arrested, and it later turns out that they were HIV positive. They may find you know a condom in their purse, and then essentially um, activities that have no no um, uh, impact on the public health. Um, are, you know, result in people going to prison. It's just, it's, it's criminal for that to happen. I mean, but, but as we've mentioned, you have a long history in the fight for civil rights for LGBTQ individuals and people living with HIV, including a fight for HIV law reform in California. Um, what tactics were used to get the laws in California modernized? Well, we really brought together uh, the HIV service providers, uh, many of the civil rights groups, um, people living with HIV who've been impacted by these laws, um, and brought together a coalition and started a broad public education program that lasted over several years, um, and really started advocating with um, members of the legislature, um, educating the public, um, and you know, and started an effort uh, really to try to reform these laws in California, which was successful in our passing um, these laws several years ago. Um, I think California is one of several states that's done this, but um, I think remains the state that actually now has a model law that um, eliminated, um, uh, basically treats HIV the same as we would any other disease. Um, you know, one of the things that's really criminal about this, uh, no pun intended, is that these laws are criminalizing a health status. Um, and I think the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, and as our guests before pointed out, just shows how crazy these laws are. I mean, why would we, you know, we don't criminalize um, health conditions for any other, um, for any other um, health condition. Um, and frankly, where there are mm -hmm. protective laws in place, um, and we did have some in California, um, they're not felonies. Um, they're, um, uh, you know, they, they apply only to extreme sort of cases. Um, but it, with, um, with uh, HIV, in many cases, you have a, a set of laws for HIV that criminalize not even 
uh, things that result in any kind of public health threat, and then you have laws res with respect to every other disease, you know, from the flu to Ebola, um, and um, that mm. you know generally will treat things as a public health um, as a public health matter. And so, um, you know, I think the COVID case shows. I mean. How crazy would it be if we were basically uh, telling people and families, um, people that were um, affected with COVID, that not only do they uh, have to deal with the health impacts of this and actually the, um, the heartbreak of um, potentially um, having a uh, you know, transmission, but on top of that, that they would actually be arrested and uh, go to prison for a health condition. I mean, we need to treat HIV as a health condition, and that's what, what it is. Yes. Well, what happens next? What states will you, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation and the Health Not Prisons Collective, be focusing on now? And what are some of the tactics that will be employed to advocate for change? Well, there's a number of states that uh, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation um, is, uh, that we're working with them in partnership on. Um, the, some of the states that we'll be looking at will be uh, Ohio, where Equality Ohio has actually started the work of educating the public and is starting to develop a strategy to change those laws there. Um, Missouri is another state. And then, of course, Nevada, where our affiliate, um, Silver State Equality, will be leading an effort there. Um, the, you know, the thing that's really um, interesting is that now, now we, it, we have a real opportunity um, to change, um, you know, to change some of these, um, to change some of these laws. The, um, you know, we are, because of scientific and medical advancements, uh, PrEP, which Cecilia talked about, um, we have a chance to end HIV in the next 10 years by the end of 2030. Um, and, but, you know, the epidemic, um, cannot end if these laws remain on the books because they create stigma and they um, prevent testing. Um, in Nevada, interestingly enough, Senator David Parks, with the help of Silver State Equality and the ACLU um, and Battleborn Progress, we passed a law in Nevada last year that creates a commission that is actually looking at reforming the HIV criminal laws in the state of Nevada. Um, our state director for Silver State Equality sits on that task force. And there is a, um, the state legislature and the governor has already um, you know, determined that uh, these laws should be reformed and we actually have an opportunity to reform them. And so in all of these states, uh, working with our partners, um, it, is a, it will be bringing people together that are affected by the laws. We need to center the voices of the people that are, sent, that are affected by this. Um, we know, for example, that, um, that uh, members of the black community and Latinx people are much more likely to be um, uh, arrested and convicted under these laws. Um, we also know that women are much mm -hmm. more likely to be arrested and convicted under these laws. So we need to center those voices as part of the process, and we need to build a coalition, and we need to educate the community about why this is so unfair, how these laws are being used. We have to educate, actually, uh, gay people, LGBTQ people, gay men in particular. There's, uh, there still is a, when we were doing some polling in California, we learned that, um, that there are many gay men who, um, uh, you know, think these laws protect them. We know that they don't. Uh, essentially, what's, what the laws are doing is it's preventing people from getting tested and getting into treatment. Um, and, and getting tested and getting into treatment, um, we know that there are you know, HIV medications now that really will bring viral load down to zero, and it makes it near impossible to transmit the virus. And as Cecilia mentioned, um, there are preventive medications called PrEP that allow you to basically take um, a medication, a pill every day, and if, you're, um, if you are taking that preventive medication, you can actually, um, uh, it's like near zero to actually um, uh, uh, contract HIV, even if you're actually having um, a sexual relations with someone um, who is not in treatment. So, um, you know, getting tested and getting into treatment, that's the public health response to this. It's not criminalizing those, uh, you know, criminalizing those who are living with, H with HIV. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned it uh, just now, but we're seeing these racial disparities play out 
uh, in our streets and in our hospitals, specifically now around COVID. Um, and the HIV laws that we're talking about today disproportionately affect a black, indigenous, and people of color. What do you think is the danger moving forward if these laws are not modernized? Well, you know, I think we're at a bit of an inflection point in our, um, you know, in our society. Um, we are, um, you know, we have, uh, we have to, you know, uh, we know that um, people, you know, black and Latinx people, uh, uh, Latinx, Cal uh, you know, people are most impacted by these laws. It's in part because of the health disparities that was talked about earlier, um, and it's in part because of the fact that we actually have discriminatory criminal justice um, laws in, in our country. Um, for example, black and Latinx Californians, in a study on HIV criminalization before our laws were reformed, made up two-thirds of the people who came into contact with the criminal justice system based on their HIV status, even though just half of people living with HIV or AIDS in California were black or Latinx. Black women make up four, made up 4% of the people diagnosed with HIV in California and white women 3%, um, you know, so roughly the same. But black women made up 21% of the people who had basically come into contact with the criminal justice system related to their HIV status and white women 15%. So, you know, we know that these laws are um, not enforced in a way that is uh, you know, there's, some, there's discrimination in the enforcement of these laws, um, and we know that there's basically, um, um, that, that um, communities of color are overly impacted by HIV transmission because of um, discrimination in the healthcare system, you know, lack of healthcare access, uh, lack of um, uh, the ability to um, uh, get into treatment, um, and lack of access to these preventative drugs. So the combination of, you know, higher rates of, um, of transmission in communities of color, plus the disparities in enforcement and discriminatory enforcement of our laws means that there's sort of a double whammy on um, uh, uh, people living uh, with HIV who are members of communities of color. Uh, I, I, this always just infuriates me, honestly. Um, you know, now I know that everyone here participating in our town hall today will want to understand how they can play a part in helping science and the law connect on this issue. What can individuals do to help create momentum around this campaign? Because I, I think that's an instrumental part of this. Well, um, in partnership with the Elizabeth Taylor Foundation, we're going to uh, Elizabeth Taylor Foundation will be creating um, educational materials that we'll be distributing and are going to be available um, through Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. We're going to be one of their partners. Um, if you're living in Nevada, contact Silver State Equality, which will be working with a coalition that has mm. been formed there to try to um, reform the HIV criminal laws. If you live in Ohio, contact Equality Ohio. Um, if you live in Missouri, contact PROMO, which is an organization there. If you're in other parts of the country, you know, contact Positive Women's Network or Transgender Law Center or Equality California or Lambda Legal. Those are all organizations that have made, um, have made this a priority. And no matter where you live, um, Congress um, is now considering um, a, a new law that would basically um, called the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act, which is um, being sponsored by Congresswoman Barbara Lee of the, um, the San Francisco Bay Area. But it's a bipartisan bill that would modernize these laws and policies at the federal level and provide a step-by-step -step plan to work with states to modernize their HIV criminal laws. So there's a lot you can do. Contact one of the organizations that's actually um, in the fight um, and, um, um, and call your member of Congress about the federal law. Um, and if you're in one of the, uh, the states I mentioned, call um, uh, the, uh, one of the groups that's, uh, that's working in those states. And if, uh, if I didn't mention a state, uh, feel free to call Equality California and we'll put you in touch with folks at your local level that are working on these issues. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Rick. That's what we need, collective action, right? Collective action. Thank you to Rick, thank you uh, to all of our speakers today. This has been, in my view, a powerful and informative experience, uh, certainly for me and hopefully for our audience as well. Uh, my understanding um, is that we do have some audience questions which um, we welcome. So before we close, we'd like to take a few minutes to answer those questions. The first one, I believe, comes to us from Eric in California. Uh, the question is, given the current climate of the politicization of science and many uh, doubting scientific facts, how do you begin to change the minds of people in government to catch up with the scientific truths regarding HIV uh, and those living with it? And this uh, goes to Doug. You know, I think often we uh, have to work uh, against systems, and sometimes we even have to dismantle them. But sometimes we need to work with systems. And when I was at the White House, uh, this uh, woman, Katherine Hansens, who runs the Center for HIV Law and Policy out of New York, asked me to convene a, a forum with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys and uh, the American Bar Association. And after these, um, many of these attorneys heard and really understood the science. They made decisions and went back to their jurisdictions and dismissed cases. So um, it is a time that feels really awful around uh, the politicization of science. And you know, we talked about him earlier, but God bless Dr. Fauci, who keeps trying to put it out there in front of us. Uh, but I do think there are opportunities for us to uh, work with groups and work with organizations who have power and who can make a difference. Well, thank you um, for that question. Now, here's another question uh, for Robert that comes from Robert in Texas. I am scared when I disclose my status to a prospective partner for fear of retaliation because I don't know or am aware of what legal rights I have. What are they, if any? Well, one right you have is you don't have to disclose your status right away. I, I think it's important for to think about what's at stake when uh, before you just choose to disclose, um, because you don't know what could happen. And um, I don't want to scare you even more. You know, either you will either a person could either be pro faced with um, being prosecuted or they could face death and some in, there have been instances where someone has died. Um, but I would encourage you to take a deep breath and just consider what will be at stake if you do disclose because then we can, you can sort of um, take steps and to think about the best way uh, to be able to disclose your status. And so just understand you have a right to not disclose right away and I think and also just get clear understanding as to uh, what things you should disclose and what things you should not have to disclose because I think there's some discrepancy there that people think they should have to disclose to any and everyone in every situation every circumstance um, according to law you should disclose prior to engaging in sex uh, so that is one thing that you you know should firmly understand that if you're choosing to engage in sex, that that is the time that you, sh you should definitely disclose before then. But just in general, if you find yourself in a situation where you may should have disclosed and you didn't, just take a deep breath, take a step back, and just, just try to think of uh, ways that you could uh, perhaps mitigate the harm and, pre and perhaps the fear uh, around disclosing, whether it means bringing in a friend or bringing in a doctor or someone to sort of uh, witness uh, you sharing uh, or disclosing your status, because uh, that way, you know, the, the pressure is not so much on you that it's sort of elevating out or leveling out there and that person um, and the power dynamic is, you know, is, is hopefully balanced in that situation. Um, but you, your right is you should disclose only when you feel that you have to. And I know there may be people that disagree with that, but again, if they're not a person living with HIV, then they wouldn't possibly understand what you're going through. And then, of course, there are people living with HIV who may feel a certain way, too, uh, depending on what period of time we find our status. But I'm just, I'm speaking from what reality looks like right now. 
um, and you have a right to uh, to uh, to uh, make sure that you can uh, record uh, or document the instances that you may uh, have a, either attempted to disclose or when you have disclosed. So that's just a, a few things that I could think of. I mean, it's from it's this is. Uh, pretty much based on one situation to another. There's no just general overall um, uh, sort of answer to it, but just know that you have a right to disclose only when it's legally, when it's safe for you to do that. And um, of course, if you mm -hmm. continue to have any fear, please feel free to reach out. Please feel free oh. to reach yeah. out um, to myself or 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 to someone that you can trust and and hopefully be able to give you some support and walk you through that process. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, this next one comes from Michelle in Tennessee. In the state of Tennessee, if you are arrested for being a sex worker, mainly black or brown trans women, or if you are turned in by a bitter ex-partner and are HIV positive, you are labeled a sex offender and are placed on the sex offender registry. What steps can we make to have these laws reviewed and changed even in an overly conservative state? This one is for Rick. Well, I think um, you know one of the goals that um, that many of the organizations that are working on this have is to reform the laws in all of these states, and that is actually one of the ways that the laws have to be reformed. Um, that's the case in many states. That not only do you end up getting um, a potential risk of going to, to you know to prison for an underlying crime that has to do with your HIV status, um, you also then get placed on a sex offender registry and. Um, you know, President Obama, in his, um, uh, you know, when he was in office in 2010 at the Justice Department, recommended that all of these laws be reformed across the country. They were put in place in the 1980s when people were, were fearful and didn't understand the disease, and they persist today. Um, and so, and in 2014, he recommended that all of these laws be reformed. So, you know, I, I can say that, um, you know, a few states have reformed them now. We're, we're working with Elizabeth Taylor Foundation on a handful of them um, that are coming up. Um, I don't, I'm not um, uh, familiar with where Tennessee is uh, right now, but I think the, you know, the national strategy is to try to get these reformed in all of these states. Um, and um, you know, if you leave your name uh, with us, um, we'll be glad to get back to you and sort of put you in touch with folks that are working on these things. The one thing I will say is that this shouldn't be a partisan issue. Um, it's not red or blue. Some of the states that have actually reformed their HIV laws have been states that have been controlled by Republican legislatures who have had Republican governors. Um, and I think the thing that we need to do and part of the education that we need to make is that we need to help people understand that you know, HIV is not a health status that is red or blue, it affects everyone. And we need to make sure that people understand that there are people in their families that may be impacted, um, that they're, you know, that the, um, uh, just how unfair these laws are, you know, criminalizing a health condition. Um, and I, I have optimism that, um, especially now in this, uh, you know, in this time where we're so focused on COVID that we actually have an opportunity to try to take some steps in all of these states that have these antiquated laws and try to reform them. For the next question, we have a question for Cecilia from Marco in Nevada. And that question is, how does HIV criminalization affect Latinx people specifically? Um, well, hello, Marco. Uh, the, the way that HIV criminalization um, affect um, Latinx people, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, that you know, like trans Latinx and you know, like other Latinx immigrants um, living with HIV are really severely impacted because um, number one, you know, um, there is limited language access. So even though they might want to find out what the law says, you know, like they might not have, you know, the, the language proficiency to do that. Number two is, you know, once you um, are criminalized, you know, like um, for HIV um, transmission or non-disclosure, chances are you have to register as a sex offender. Um, and that would, 
you know, like severely impact those who might currently have immigrant status and is trying to like um, get naturalized and get their citizenship. And it's even worse, you know, like if it's somebody who are like coming to this country, escaping violence in their own country, um, they might not even be able to um, get any of that. Um, um, they might not be even be able to get asylum um, because of this. Um, so I think that um, what we're doing right now is really to like challenge these like irrational like um, irrational laws and you know and really like show how how dysfunction you know our current system is um, and. You know, I, I think that, you know, that's continue to be a question that we need to, like, put um, to our leadership in Congress and in, um, in states. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. Uh, this next question for Rick, um, our, our lawyer on the panel, comes to us from Jason in Mississippi. Now, in Mississippi, we have tried for the last decade, wow, to amend current HIV laws, and it sadly never gets out of committee. For conservative state houses like ours, do you suggest teaming up with other causes, such as breast cancer or uh, Alzheimer's, and merge bills to at least create some type of progress? You know, I think that's a good, um, that's a good strategy. Uh, when we reform these laws in California, um, and, you know, even in California, it was um, over a four-year effort from the time that we started until we were finally able to get a law passed. Um, you know, we started with the HIV service providers and the LGBTQ civil rights organizations, you know, were the core of our strategy group, but we built a huge coalition um, that was, I think in the end, by the time we got the law passed, was probably the largest coalition of organizations in, you know, the health, civil rights, progressive communities, even the environmental movement. I think we had something like 200 organizations uh, signed support letters uh, to every member of the legislature. We were, um, so I do think that, um, you know, part of this is really to sort of expand your, um, you know, uh, the folks that are supporting this um, and making sure that, you know, that as many voices are there calling members of the legislature um, to really help them understand how unfair these things are and how they're impacting people in our communities. Well, thank you all again. Uh so much for joining us today and to all of our panelists for their time and their dedication to this issue, this very important issue. I've learned so much uh, and I look forward to staying in this fight with all of you, with our panelists and with our audience. For our wonderful audience, we invite you to help us change these laws because they have to be changed. Please visit hivisnotacrime-etaf.org or text ETAF to 33777. And please join the movement to modernize HIV laws. I'm joining the movement. And all we need is your voice. And for that, we thank you in advance. Take care. <laughs>